Welcome to Modern Education, the show that dives into all things relevant to learning. Modern Education has a guest each week for an in-depth conversation about some aspects of teaching and learning. Join the host of Modern Education, Benjamin S. Woodford, as we continue to evolve the important topics for effective learning today. We will unpack the ways community members, students, teachers, parents, and researchers approach learning in all its forms. And now, introducing the host of Modern Education, Benjamin S. Woodford. Welcome back to Modern Education. I'm your host, Ben Woodford, and we're here again with another exciting talk. My guest today is Michael McFall. He's a professor of political science, director and senior fellow at the Freeman Spungley Institute for International Studies, and the Peter and Helen Bing Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He joined the Stanford faculty in 1995. He's also an analyst for NBC News and a contributing columnist to the Washington Post. Dr. McFall served for five years in the Obama administration, first as special assistant to the president and senior director for Russian and Eurasian affairs at the National Security Council at the White House, then as a U.S. ambassador to the Russian Federation. He also has authored several books. His current research interests include American foreign policy, great power relations, and the relationship between democracy and development. Dr. McFall's latest book is called From Cold War to Hot Peace, and American ambassador in Putin's Russia, and it's coming out spring 2018. I'm going to bring Dr. McFall on the line, and we'll start our conversation. Dr. McFall, McFall, thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. It's so exciting to have you here. The honor is really all mine. Uh, I've been a big fan of KZSU for a long, long time. Really? Really? Over 35 years. Oh, man, that is an honor. I mean, we we have such a... It's on my uh, radio dial on my car right now. Oh, awesome. And hopefully everybody who's listening totally understands that. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, you're you're widely considered a leading authority on Russia and international relations. You've authored several treaties and things like that. I'm wondering if you could give us a story about how you became interested in the region and sort of developed this love that you're well known for. Yeah, thanks for asking the question, because it's kind of a strange story. Um, I grew up in Montana. Uh, not very worldly person at the time. Uh, never been abroad, never been to California uh, until I came to Stanford as a freshman. My junior year of high school, uh, we moved from Butte to Bozeman, which probably means nothing to you, right? And nothing B to words. most of your listeners. <laughs> two two B towns in Montana, but the difference between Butte, which is a pretty tough mining town, and Bozeman, which is a college town, had a huge impact on me. And I, I got more interested in intellectual academic things and I joined the debate team. Mm. And the year that I joined, the uh, resolution was the U.S. should improve its trade policy. And so my partner and I ran a case about, uh, it's a very obscure thing, uh, amending the Jackson-Vanik Amendment to the 1974 Trade Act mm. to increase trade with the Soviet Union. That was our case. Uh, by the way, my former debate partner is now a senator from Montana, Steve Daines. So uh, we were pretty good uh, yeah. as a debate team. Uh, he's a Republican. I'm not. But uh, we, were, we were a good team. So that's what sparked it. And yeah. when I got to Stanford as a 17-year-old kid in 1981, uh, kind of the height of the attentions, Ronald Reagan had just become president. They called it the second coming of the Cold War. And I was alarmed by it. I was scared by it, to be honest. And so... Fall quarter of my freshman year, I took two courses that changed my life. Uh, One was first year Russian. And the second was a course called How Nations Deal with Each Other. Mm -hmm. Professor Steve Krasner, who's still on our faculty, he taught that. And that was it. That was the interest. And and I had this theory that if we could just get to know the Russians or the Soviets, as we called them back then, that would help to decrease tensions. And and so uh, sophomore summer, um, uh, I took my first trip abroad ever to Leningrad. Uh, Back then, we called it the Evil Empire. (laughs) Imagine what my mother thought about that in Montana. You know, uh, she she was worried I was going to go live with all the you know long haired communist hippies in California. Right. Uh, I came home with very long hair, by the way, after my first year <laughs> here, and she was worried about that. And then my second year, she's like, "You're going to the evil empire," uh, but I did, and that you know that was really the moment. It, it was you know, there's nothing like seeing a country to have a better understanding of it, and. 
over the next 30 years, I've lived many parts of my life. Uh, you know, I think I've added it up six or seven years of my life I've lived in that country. Wow. The last being the two years as the U.S. ambassador. Right, right. Wow. So what I'm hearing is this this sort of formative experience with a very simple, like a school project with yes. a friend yes. created just a little bit of interest or intrigue into the region and the issues. That's right. And that has blossomed into a life's work. Yes. I didn't think it at the time it was yeah. going to, but it, you know, really those early years here at Stanford and I had tremendous professors, uh, Alexander Dolan in the history department, uh, Alex George in political science. They both passed away, but at a very young age, um, they were great mentors to me. Uh, I didn't have a lot of money, so they even kind of subsidized my research wow. uh, to help uh, me along in this path. And you know, I've actually tried to get away from Russia from time to time in my yeah. academic <laughs> career and political career, but it keeps pulling me back. Um, what are some of the things you've tried to do to get away from it? What, what are the interests that you tried to follow and kind of ended up coming back to? Well, so I have a I had this deep interest in the Soviet Union because of the conflict of the Cold War, right? Mm -hmm. And then, as the Soviet Union uh, fell apart, uh, I was there as a student again in 1991, mm -hmm. 1990, 91, the academic year. I was at Moscow State University, MGU. Uh, I have my T-shirt. Mm -hmm. MSU is Montana State University and Moscow State University. I got both those T-shirts. Oh wow. Um, and But that was a very invigorating time for me because I also have this deep interest in democracy, democratic transitions, and that was a very hopeful time. Uh, and so I got more politically involved. I mean, mm. before I was more academic, and then I switched. I joined a non-governmental organization back then whose job is called the National Democratic Institute. Their job is to support democratic transitions. Right. So that sustained for a while. Um, in the 2000s, things went awry. Putin came in. Or there was rising autocracy. And so the Cold War was over. That was a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, My interest in that had, had fallen off. Uh, the prospects for democracy seem trapped, and they still are to this day. And so I broadened my horizon to teach, as you mentioned. I, I used to teach a big lecture course here on democracy development and rule of law, mm -hmm. which looked at all countries around the world and lots mm -hmm. of history. Uh, later, I did a big project on Iran with my colleague here, Abbas Milani, um, in the, the 2000s. But it was really, again, uh, you know, Barack Obama's campaign in 2006 when they reached out to me and said, we need a Russia guy. Um, mm -hmm. We want you to do it. And I said, well, what about broadly just having somebody to advise about democracy more generally? And they said, you can do that on the side, but we really need somebody to work on Russia. So right. first I joined the campaign, um, and then we won, and that's how I ended up at the White House. So the president called you and said, hey, we want you to help with this. To be more precise, uh -huh. it, was, uh, it was somebody else. It was Susan okay. Rice is her name. Okay. Another Stanford grad. Yeah. Uh, we were in school together here, and then we were in school at Oxford together. And it's a good story about Stanford, right? Stanford yeah. Mafia. Uh, she called me up, and uh, I had actually volunteered in a pretty low capacity for another presidential candidate in 2004. I'm even too embarrassed, maybe, to mention his name. Uh, you know, he flamed out uh, with his pretty haircuts and other things like that. John Edwards is who, who it was, and I said to Susan, "Well, you know, I have some loyalty to this other campaign, and he was planning to run again in 2008." Mm -hmm. And Susan's kind of blunt, and uh, she's a close friend of mine, so she can be blunt with me. And she yeah. said, you got to be kidding me. Um, this guy is one of the smartest people I've ever met. He is going to be the next president of the United States, and you should jump on this train now. And I had not really known much about uh, yeah. Senator Obama. I'd seen his speech in 2004 on TV, the incredible orator. Uh, but it was really because of Susan's conviction, not because of my mm. research about his policy positions that right. I joined. And um, and it was a ride of the lifetime. I mean, I, uh, I deeply uh, – that election itself was such a hopeful time in America. And I, it was just such a great thing to be a part of it, to be at the Democratic Convention. And, you know, it was in Denver in this stadium. And this guy was really inspirational. Then we won – 
And the transition was a little rocky, a lot of fighting of who's going to get what jobs. But I ended up, you know, getting this job working at the White House day one, January 21st, uh, 2009. That was my first day of work. And, um, you know, as I talk about in the book, we made mistakes and things mm-hmm. didn't work out the way we wanted, but um, on certain issues. But man, it was a honor of a lifetime to work for President Obama. Um, I, I, I feel deeply grateful to that phone call that Susan Rice did for me. Absolutely, and and I love the part about the story about how your friend yeah. sort of just Trumps said, everything. "You're going to do this," and you trusted her, and it turned into something amazing. And it really yes. speaks to the value of those social connections and the trust that people can influence us to do Yeah, it's a good lesson. It's a good story. I I met her when I was, you know, 20 years old as a Stanford senior. Right, um, right. Had a big impact on my life. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it, and a lot of people's lives. In fact, I think uh, Obama has really changed the conversation in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's been powerful. Good point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So... I wanted to talk a little bit just about education. So first idea is, what are the kind of things you wanted to make sure your own kids knew? Maybe about, we could talk about diplomacy or yeah. international or just foreign relations or just interpersonal relations. Yes. Yeah. So what are some of the things you really want to do and instill in your own children? Well, the, I'll get to that. But the first thing I want to say, um, you know, I am a product of what education can do. Like, you know, I was... You know, I grew up in fairly modest means. My father was a country western musician. My mother was an administrator at the university. Um, uh, The day I picked up the application to Stanford um, uh, and prodded by my, you know, another thing about friendship, Steve Smith is his name, my my chemistry partner in my junior year. And, uh, you know, for me, moving to Bozeman, that was like the big city. And, and, and I really wanted to go to Montana State. I was hoping I could go there. And, and Steve was always like, oh, no, you got to go see the world. You got to educate yourself. You got to expand your horizons. And so one day we walked down to the counselor's office. I picked up the application and, and it said Stanford, comma, CA. And I was confused by that. I was like, Connecticut? Because I just assumed Stanford was where all those other Ivy League schools were. So right. it gives you a little bit of sense of how out of the blue I got in. And um, uh, and if not for financial aid, I wouldn't have come. I planned to go to McAllister College. That was my dream. I got mm-hmm. in. It was cheaper for me to go to Stanford. Um, and that just transformed my entire life. I mean, yeah. without that, I would have done something very different. So... Education really is the equal. It, it can bring opportunity, and, and and I feel deeply indebted to that. Uh, that Stanford did that for me and took a chance on me. You know, my scores were way way below. I was in the t- bottom tenth quarter, uh, tenth percentile on those stupid SAT scores. Uh, yeah. Somebody took a chance on me, and and I thank them for that in admissions. For my own kids. Um, uh, you know, they moved to Washington with me. Uh, we left Paradise here and, and went mm-hmm. to Washington for three years, and then they signed up for another two years in Moscow. Um, uh, and that was difficult for them. I don't want to um, uh, to remind people that it is hard to move, especially you know my oldest son who was in high school at the time when we moved back here. But uh, I knew that. Just as the experience of living overseas when I was a young uh, Stanford student changed my life, that spending a couple years uh, in Moscow was going to have a big impact on the way they saw the world. And it did um, in a couple of ways. One, uh, you, you see your own country in a different perspective when you're living abroad. It sounds stupid and banal to say, but until you've done it, you can't experience it. Uh, number two... Um, they developed a, a deeper appreciation for European history because of so much history that has happened in that part of the world. And, you know, things like, because uh, the anniversary is coming up, uh, you know, we call it the end of World War II. They call it the end of the Great Patriotic War, May 9th. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, we learned, and I most certainly as a kid in Montana, learned about World War II from one perspective and the heroic role that America played. Well, living in Moscow, you get a very 
pretty different perspective about right. who won that war and who sacrificed and, and who defeated Stalinism, uh, uh, fascism. Um, and that was that was great to see that and and for them to experience just an alternative perspective. And then and then three, um, we were there at a time when. U.S. Russian relations took a turn for the worse, right? Mm, yeah. um, nothing to do with me personally. That was just that happened. And uh, in their school, uh, the Anglo American schools, suddenly everybody knew they were the. I have two sons. Um, yeah. uh, one's a sophomore here at Stanford and one's in high school still. Um, uh, suddenly they had to represent America in some weird way. And even sometimes we're asked to speak on behalf of all of you. You know, well, what do the Americans think, Cole? You know, and yeah. suddenly you're like, well, you know, who, who nominated me to speak for, you know, 300 million people? Yeah. But um, that was a good experience for them mm -hmm. to think about how, what that means to, to, to represent and, and what it means when people have, and in our case, you know, I would say, uh, lots of disinformation about what the United States was doing was happening that time for them to struggle with that. They, they learned a lot from that. Yeah. So it sounds like you're really speaking to the, the social aspect of being immersed in this other country with yes. other ideals and having to sort of think about where they came from and where they are going and how they fit into that whole puzzle has been really transformative for them as a worldview. I hope so. I think yeah. so. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. So that, again, it speaks to that experience of getting outside of your comfort zone exactly and doing things that allow you to kind of build up this bigger view of the world that's right yeah uh, so what about how has all of this maybe influenced your approach to being a teacher or yeah. advisor or professor within your, your duties here on campus that's a great question um, so I teach courses on American foreign policy, for instance. I teach a course right now uh, called Russia in the West. And I think in terms of my academic work, right, I, I still try to – I just published a – peer-reviewed journal article. I, I, it just came out last week, so I'm still trying to keep my oar in, in you know, conventional social science and keep engaged with that. What I see in terms of the in impact on my academic work is, and this won't sound surprising, but it, I see it in what I write, is after five years in the government, I, I see the role of individuals and decisions as having a bigger impact on history than I would have said to you, you know, before I joined the government, because mm. we have theories about how states behave and and uh, all states kind of behave the same way, and it's the balance of power between states that cause outcomes. That's a that's called realism. It's a big theory, and actors and individuals don't play a role in that. It doesn't mm. matter who's the president. It doesn't matter who's in Congress. It doesn't matter who's the ambassador. You, you know, there's the state of the United States and the state of Russia, and they're clashing around the world, and being up close and personal, watching decision making, um, especially when I worked at the White House, you know, sitting in the White House Situation Room when we're making momentous decisions about whether to, uh, you know, intervene in Libya or not. I was there for that. Whether we're doing sanctions on Iran or not. Uh, how to uh, negotiate a new nuclear weapons agreement. Uh, that was a big piece of what I did in 2010. And I saw contingency. I saw that that it mattered that President Obama was the one sitting at the, the head of the table, that mm -hmm. he had a perspective on things. And the counterfactual of somebody else being the chair would have impacted the policy in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think our, our theories in, in social sciences are not very good at picking that up because it requires a lot of very fine qualitative information that's hard to come by. But it most certainly in my own teaching, I try to, to underscore these possibilities that it's not just structures that, that determine outcomes, mm -hmm. that actors play a role as well. Oh, wow. That's powerful. I, I got chills thinking about what this can do. I mean, if you think about you 
want to look at structures and look at things because those are easy have to, to understand measure. Them, and they're right? easy to measure. That's right. a very good point. And measurement gives us some piece of information, but you're talking about this more this personal and interpersonal connection. I mean, similar to the story you just shared about being involved with the Obama administration was really connected to an individual person yes. speaking to you as a familiar person they knew. That's right. And it sounds like a similar parallel you're talking about for these government decisions and these big things that happen. Yes. They come down to that personal level and that individual connection and understanding. Yep. Individuals yeah. matter. Yeah. Now, how to measure it. I'm glad you use that word because yeah. that's the tricky part, right? And right. that's why we in political science, if we don't have a way to measure what we're trying to see as an independent variable, as something impacting an outcome, we shy away from it. Mm. But that's a mistake. Uh, we not Sometimes we have to use proxies. We have to have approximations of the values. And without question, my, my research and my way of thinking about outcomes in international relations have been affected by my time in government. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like it's a, a great takeaway in any field you're working in if you recognize that dynamic is probably true everywhere you go. I think it is. And I, I also, as an advisor to students, right, I mm-hmm. have advisees. Um, it's also a good story about your own career, like uh, that individuals can matter. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think out here sometimes in the Silicon Valley, there's this uh, pretty negative attitude towards the government, and those are not good jobs, and nobody has any impact. And mm-hmm. particularly the State Department has that reputation. I'm going to, you know, punch visas for two years, and, right. um, you know, well, why should I do that? I'm a Stanford student. And, um, and I'll, again, I'll be honest that I did not appreciate the, the role that people in the State Department can play, um, but I try to encourage people to think about those jobs because they can have an impact. Mm-hmm. Um, and I came away with a much deeper appreciation of what our State Department does, what our diplomats do, and, and I value that work a lot more, and I'd like to see more Stanford students think about that kind of public service. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think that is a great transition to my next question, which is really about uh, the role you see education playing in the international relationships and building these mutually beneficial economic and social ties between countries. Where do you see education fitting into all that? Well, the... It's fundamental that as we as a country make foreign policy, and I would say the same if I lived elsewhere, that we don't make decisions based on bad information about other countries. Mm -hmm. And I witnessed that many, many times in the government. Um, Assumptions about, I was very involved, for instance, in the Arab Spring in 2011 when Mm -hmm. I worked at the White House. And... um, I hate. I don't want to be so blunt, but we just didn't have enough experts on Tunisia and Syria and Egypt and Libya. Uh, I'd look around the room and or Yemen and Bahrain, and uh, we have to invest in that. And um, that granular information that, that that you know understanding coalitions inside Bahrain, you know, that's mm-hmm. a we needed that, and I felt like we didn't have enough of that, and mm-hmm. so. Uh, and and we've kind of moved away from um, that kind of expertise, right? Our, our theories want to generalize. We want to treat all countries in a data set. We don't want to know the specifics about the difference between Yemen and Bahrain. We just want to treat them in a right. in a regression. Um, <laughs> and there's a time and place for that. I, I fully appreciate that. But I think we've gone too far. Mm. And we need to train people you know, in history and anthropology and languages. Um, my time in government, when people ask me, well, what was useful to you in terms of your own education? Without question, the two biggest assets I had was that I could speak Russian and that I knew the history. I knew history. Mm, yeah. That empowered me in the policy making process. And Granted, I had a boss like Barack Obama who valued education, right? That helps. Right, <laughs> so right. um, uh, he's a pretty intellectual guy himself. Um, and but but without for me, that was just a huge upside to be able to be able to do those things and and have those skills. And and the the one thing we're going to have conflicts with countries. We have conflicts with Russia right now, and sometimes those can't be avoided. Uh, but what we can't have is conflicts based on 
bad information or misperception. And yeah. that happens when we don't have enough knowledge about the other. And and uh, I always felt that. Uh, but after five years in government, I feel it even more strongly. And and we are we're falling down as a country. We're not investing in that kind of education. And, you know, we, we had more resources devoted to it during the Cold War. We've kind of gotten out of those habits, and I think we need to get back to them. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about, I think the term is high modernism, right? It's looking down from a bird's eye view and just kind of grabbing the statistics and using that to make all the decisions. Right. And what you're describing sounds like a lot more emphasis on the personal, interpersonal, the kind of quali- qualitative, qualitative understandings of what's happening. That's right. We got to have both. Right. Uh, but the pendulum swung too far in the opposite direction. And I think that qualitative knowledge of countries, at least for diplomacy, other other fields it would be different, but for diplomacy, uh, you got to have that. You got to be able to understand. Again, you don't have to agree with the perspective of the diplomat on the other side of your table, but you need to understand where their hypotheses and where their analytic frameworks have come from. And oftentimes that's history and culture. Yeah. Yeah. And I really, I really love the piece that you mentioned too, just about having the language and having the historical knowledge and how that enabled you to be able to start having these conversations and be an active participant, not as an outsider who can't speak the language. I mean, that alone, that alone is so important because if you speak the language, you've shown that you've invested in that, that country and those people enough to be part of whatever conversation is going on. Yeah, and I, I benefited tremendously from that. that. The respect that you show when you try to learn somebody's other language, and Russian's a hard language, by the way, so yeah. uh, you know, there's a high uh, bar to get over to, to be conversant. I made mistakes sometimes as ambassador and uh, in speaking, and they got mm-hmm. me in trouble. But for the most part, uh, people were appreciative that I was, uh, you know, being respectful of their culture by speaking their language. I spoke Russian more than most ambassadors. Most you can get in trouble, and I decided to lean in and just, you know, mix it up. And yeah. I would be on radio programs and uh, on TV giving speeches in Russian. I even gave some lectures in Russian, you know hour-long lectures, uh, uh-huh. and, you know, I, I made some mistakes, but I think on the most part, uh, people appreciated the effort. Yeah, and I think that's true in every context. You sp- Even just a few words to introduce yourself yes. in another language shows that you're not just some, I think there's almost a perception of Americans just sort of blundering through the world, assuming everyone's just going to speak English, right. and that effort means something. Can mean something. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your latest book. Okay. Okay. So it's called From Cold War to Hot Peace, An American Ambassador in Putin's Russia. It's coming out in spring 2018. And I've only been able to get a hold of some reviews, but they said it's amazing. Every <laughs> review I read said it was a riveting read and really engaging and great stories and everything. Um, I'm wondering if you could give us a little teaser, maybe about one of the stories from the book, get people's uh, palate wet so sure. they'll go out and finish the book? Well, so the, the book is really three stories wrapped into one. So uh, the big story is about the Cold War ended. We thought we were going to have a closer relationship with Russia. We're now in this confrontational phase. What happened? Mm-hmm. So I try to explain that analytically, and that's kind of my social science, political science hat. Within that is a a sub-story of the Obama administration, because Mm -hmm. in 2009, uh, we had a policy that we called Reset, where we uh, managed to get in a more cooperative relationship with Russia, and in particular with Russian President um, uh, Dmitry Medvedev. And that, and that ended in a much more confrontational way back in 2012 and and, and really punctuated um, with uh, Russia's intervention in Ukraine. So I, mm-hmm. I want to explain the story of the Obama, the arc of that story. It looked good, things were going well, and then not. Right. And then the third story weaved in there is my own personal story um, of, you know, starting when I was a kid, as we talked about earlier, and... Um, uh, my engagement with Russia and my optimism about 
closer relations and then what happened with my own views, right? So mm-hmm. I try to weave those through. You know, I'm a, uh, before the, I've written many books, but they've all been academic books. I've never used the word I yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ever, ever in a book before. <laughs> so this is a big experiment for me um, yeah. to try to bounce back and forth. And it's not just a memoir either. It's it's somewhere in between. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, it's a very uh, unique design in that way. Uh, and so you do, j- we jump around from big theories of international relations to, uh, you know, uh, doing the two-step, uh, you know, in Spasso House and, and trying to use, uh, and I did, I, I was a pretty, um, I think both w- w- would agree that I was a unique ambassador. I'm trying to use a neutral word. Some loved it, some hated it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I tried to experiment with uh, unique ways to try to engage with Russian s- the state, but also Russian society and all of Russian society, not just the elites. But mm. w- we had a kind of game plan to do that. And uh, I was one of the first ambassadors, for instance, to use Twitter. Hmm. Um, that was brand new. Secretary Clinton said to me, she said, Mike, when you go out there, deal with the Russian government, but reach out to society, and Twitter's one way you can do it. Um, and it was, you know, on balance, I think it was a great thing because it allowed, um, you know, the deputy foreign minister of the the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs to engage with me on Twitter, but also the high school kid in Vladivostok. Mm-hmm. And that was pretty shocking that a U.S. ambassador would respond to a, a Twitter. Uh, Twitter wasn't the only platform. We used other ones. but mm-hmm. uh, uh, And that would really mix things up and, and I think created a different image of who I was and who our country was. Uh, but I mentioned the two-step because we talked about Montana. So mm-hmm. one of my first events, uh, you know, you, you, I, you know, and I was an accidental ambassador. Remember, I wasn't planning to be an ambassador. Most academics just spend two years in the government and then come back. They have to usually. Mm-hmm. Stanford's a little more accommodating. Um, uh, but, you know, the president didn't want me to leave the government. And so this was his idea to keep me in the government working Russia, but with a new job. Uh, so we arrive, uh, and and suddenly we're living in this giant mansion. It's called Spasso House. Your listeners can look it up and take a virtual tour. It's this incredible, you know, 19th century mansion. Wow! Um, and one of the first events in our. 600-person uh, capacity ballroom. That's part of our house. Uh, <laughs> you know, my kids used to play badminton in there in the oh, wintertime because wow. yeah, it's that yeah. big. Uh, was a group from Montana, actually, a country-western group coming from Montana. It, just, it had been scheduled before me. Yeah. It was just a coincidence. And they're lining up the seats uh, for this concert. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, where's the dance floor? And they were like, oh, Mr. Ambassador, we... We don't dance at Spasso House. This is a concert, right? You know, mm-hmm. it's very formal. And I'm mm-hmm. like, we got to at least leave open the possibility that people might want to react to the music. And, right. and remember, my father's a country western musician. And the worst night uh, at a gig, he, w- he would come home, is when everybody just sit on their hands. Uh, right. you know, that's the worst night of all. And we had a big argument with the staff, and they agreed, let's just take three rows out. And uh, uh, I got up. And you know, I know how to do the two-step, not that well, but uh, I pulled it off. And uh, the minute I got up, you know, 30 seconds later, there were 100 people dancing. And Russians and Americans and all the drama between Putin and Obama, people had forgotten about. And mm-hmm. it was a great way to kind of connect. And, and culture are oftentimes is a great way to connect. And... Um, you know, that was a fun night. Yeah, yeah. And it really sounds like you brought some of yourself to that. Exactly. And that seems to be a really um, a central theme kind of in the book, too. You brought, it is. You brought yourself into your scholarship and said, look, it's not just about this. I'm a person that is in, interacting within this context. Right. Yeah. 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 Very, very interesting If you ever stuff. get the chance to be ambassador, take it. <laughs> it was a great job. Was well, a- if you ever call me and offer me the job, <laughs> right. I will gladly All say right. yes, All sir. Right. Let's okay. be in touch. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, I'm curious what you would think are the top issues that Americans should be aware of when it comes to understanding international concepts and diplomacy and their own involvement with all of that. Yeah. 
Well, one, they should be involved because we are a democracy and we have the opportunity to um, constrain and shape the way the White House and the State Department does foreign policy. And I think we sometimes in our history, some of the worst chapters in our history was when the public was not engaged. Mm -hmm. And they, we just kind of left it up to the experts. Uh, you know, I think the the decision to invade Iraq in particular lingers with me as a time that I wish there would have been more societal engagement, members of Congress engagement, media to to analyze that decision a little closer. Um, so, uh, and in the, the new era we're in now with a, a relatively new president that has some... Uh, I'm trying to think a d diplomatic way. He has some rather exotic ideas about foreign policy. I think it's a time that we should be vigilant and watching and educate yourself about what's going on because it does, it can make a difference. Uh, it most certainly was surprising to me when I was in the government how much we did care about public opinion and what people thought. There is that yeah. ability to be engaged. And, and I myself uh, feel an obligation to also be engaged, uh, mm -hmm. to help educate. So I'm on TV. Uh, you know, I speak in Washington and New York, but I also speak in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, because and on pokey radio shows for <laughs> under Stanford's basement. <laughs> exactly, because I want to be part of that, that process. So that, that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is, um, you know, things are changing uh, because of technology, and um, we are not quite ready for those changes, right? And 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 one of them that we experienced in our election in 2016 was the role that external actors, in this case Russia, but there will be many, many more, uh, will seek to play in influencing politics inside our country and mm. using our technologies, right, using our companies, Facebook and Twitter and Google, right. uh, to have the ability to do that. And and with that, it's one of the projects uh, with several colleagues here I'm working on right now um, uh, about disinformation right. and the manipulation of what appears to be uh, facts, but in fact, you know, our distortions. Uh, I experienced that as an ambassador uh, back in 2012. I was a um, uh, the target of a lot of Russian disinformation. Mm -hmm. Just blatant things were said about me that were false. Yeah. But how do you fight with it? How do you uh, try to push back on it? Turns out it's pretty complicated. Um, uh, what's an example? Well, the, the grossest example was one day a video appeared on YouTube uh, suggesting I was a pedophile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty awful. Right. Uh, what do you do with that? You ignore it? Well, then if you're ignoring it, people think about it. You would, and I just hesitated with you. I don't know if you uh -huh. noticed because uh -huh. I don't, you know, so because once you mention it, right. then all of a sudden another People's brains are thinking about it in different ways, right? And and uh, you you somehow um, broadcast it by even mentioning it, right? And it's like giving credence to something, right? You, you, where's the fine line? Right. Between? I mean, another one was they used to accuse me of giving money to the opposition to Putin, and they would run videos with like the back of some guy's head that kind of looked like me, mm -hmm. uh, mysteriously handing out money, um, and there, it would just just looked enough that it could be true that people would believe it. Um, well, that technology is advancing at a uh, rapid pace. Yeah. And there's going to be, it's just around the corner when there's going to be videos of people speaking and, and words are going to be spliced in and it's going to be very difficult to know whether that is them speaking or not. And so that dimension of how we protect our democracy and make decisions about who rules us based on our based on Americans, not mm -hmm. outsiders. You know, that is a new I think a dimension that, that demands a lot more attention. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm curious because, you know, you spoke about your own I'm gonna get you out of here in a few minutes. So yeah, no. uh, but I I you spoke about your own sort of um, desire to be involved. And I'm wondering at the, the level of government, what is the government's responsibility to get people engaged with government? As a, That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, I don't have a great answer. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I mean, philosophically, as somebody who believes in small d democracy, right? Not mm -hmm. Democratic Party versus Republican, but engagement. Uh, I always want more. Um, I think that leads to better outcomes and it leads to uh, constraints on really bad outcomes. That's a, mm -hmm. maybe another way to put it. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, President Obama used to say, don't do stupid things uh, <laughs> as part of our foreign policy. So just not doing stupid things is an achievement. Where there, to what extent the government should take that responsibility? I, I, I mean, I think we should. And most certainly when I was in the government, we did that all the time. We used mm -hmm. to engage with um, civic leaders and, um, you know, the U.S. Congress, the media to try to tell our story. Um, but there were others that thought that was a bad idea, like too much transparency and diplomacy mm -hmm. constrains what you can do. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I'm hesitant. It's a great question. I'll think more about it, and I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. Oh, I, I, I can't wait to hear your answer. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I, I always just think with the proliferation of media and the way we all have expectation for a certain level of engagement in yes. the things we see, Good point. we're really looking for a higher level of engagement with just in the way we get information. You know, we go to a Hollywood movie, we expect huge explosions and something yeah. that really is gripping. That's a good point. And then we watch the news and it's like, oh, change the channel. That's kind right. of boring. Right. That's, and we've, that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, we got to figure out a better way to communicate. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I do think we're just about out of time. So I wanted to ask, if is there a last thing you would like to leave the audience with, a piece of in idea or encouragement or something that you just would like to leave them with to think about? Buy the book. Mm -hmm. uh, book's oh, out yeah. May 8th. Uh, and and I, here's my pledge. Uh, and in the spirit of engagement, um, after the book's been out for a couple weeks, I will advertise on Twitter. I'm at McFall. You can mm -hmm. find me on Twitter. And we'll do some um, uh, virtual seminars mm. uh, where I, w I used to do this as ambassador. Um, and I really enjoyed them because... For an hour, I would be there with my staff, and we would, you know, try to interact with all Russian questions. So I'm going to do that with the book. Oh, great. So everybody go do your homework, buy the book, read it, and then look for me on Twitter, and we'll have a virtual conversation. We'll keep it going. Excellent. So uh, we have to say something along the lines of, if you're interested, go get the book. You can engage with you to extend that conversation and really be able to interact with these ideas if if it grips you you're going to offer a chance to extend that and I'll really, be there oh that's awesome I guarantee you why I will engage oh that's amazing yeah and I think people will be very lucky to get that chance with you so again Great. thank you for coming on the show it's been Thanks for it's having such me. a joy to hear Great all the conversation. things you have to say absolutely okay so I am the host of Modern Education Ben Woodford you are here with the professor Michael McFall from Stanford University he is an amazing man with wonderful ideas and uh, former working, formerly working with the president and just so many great things. So if you want to check out his book, that'd be a great thing. And again, thank you for tuning in. We will catch you every Friday from three to four here on KZSU 90.1 Stanford. To revisit the content from today's show or hear previous episodes, you can find us on YouTube and Facebook by searching for Modern Education. Make sure to come back next week as we continue the conversation and visit new topics connected to learning in all its modern form. The show is written, produced, and hosted by Benjamin S. Woodford. I'm the announcer, Darlene Franklin, and this has been a production of 90.1 KZCU Stanford. See you next week for more Modern Education.